Well, good morning. It's lovely to be with you today, and um, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great, like I said earlier, to be partners together in the gospel in Nottingham. And um, just thank you for the warm welcome. It's been lovely to come in, as Deb said, to have smiles and people helping you find where you need to go, um, and been very blessed through the time with you so far. Um, with the time that remains, we're going to look at those words from 1 Peter. Um, so I'm going to pray again as we come to God's word. Our Father, we thank you for what we've just read about your word, that the word of the Lord endures forever. Lord, please, would that be the word that we hear this morning? Please, would you speak to our hearts and change us by your spirit so that that word might give us new life. It might go on giving us life and it might help us to be people who honour you in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder where you're setting your hope at the moment. What are you setting your hope on? Perhaps for you, it's the hope of something that's coming up soon. Maybe a holiday, a wedding, or or maybe a birthday that you're looking forward to. Um, Maybe it's something that you're hoping to get, a a new job, a new house, maybe even a new relationship. Um, Maybe it's the hope of a new stage in life. Um, Maybe you're hoping to leave school, to graduate from university, to get married, to have kids, to retire. Maybe to do all of those things in that order. Um, Or maybe your hope's set just a bit lower. Maybe this week the hope is just to survive, to get through another week and and to make it another week in this world. But whatever it is we set our hope on, where our hope is will affect how we live our lives. What we hope in will get our attention and our time and our effort and our energy, won't it? Um, What we long for is going to shape our priorities and in many ways define the kind of life that we live. And Peter knows that's true as he writes his letter. As he writes, he's writing to to Christians who've been scattered. He calls them in verse 2, elect exiles. Um, As elect, these are God's chosen people. They've been set apart to belong to him forever. But as exiles, they just don't fit in in the world. They don't belong. And they're, they're suffering for their faith. And I'm sure you looked at that last time. And as Peter writes to Christians in a situation like this, he knows that they're in danger of two things. First, as they suffer now, they're in danger of losing sight of the future that that God's given to them. And the second danger is that they lose their sight of what God has promised them in the future. They don't live the lives they've been called to live now. They don't live consistently with the hope that God has held out for them. Um, And maybe seek to blend in, to fit in, to make life easier so they can just survive. And in the same way, as we live as exiles in the world, we face the same danger, don't we, as them? Um, We too, in so many ways, are tempted to lower our gaze from what God has promised us in the future and to set that hope on many lesser things. Maybe that's holidays, maybe it's promotions, maybe it's just survival. But as we set our eyes on these things and look for a better life here and now, we're in danger, just like these these people, of living inconsistently with the hope that God has given us. And so in in these verses um, today, Peter shows us how to live consistently with our hope. He's just spoken about that in the the passage before, the wonderful hope that is for God's people. And here he says, this is how you're to live in light of that. This is how um, to live it out. So verse 13, he says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. He says, set your hearts on that hope and then live in light of it. And our passage today shows two ways that we're called to do that today. The first half, our future hope calls us to be holy. And then the second half, our future hope calls us to love one another deeply. With the time that we've got left, we're going to look at those two things. So first of all, be holy in all you do. Let's read verse 14 again. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now we just sung about holiness this morning. And holy is a word that comes up again and again in the Bible. It's used to describe God, his people, special days. It's used to describe the temple and the things that got used in the temple. Um, And very simply, the word holy means set apart or distinct. Something holy was something set aside for a different purpose, a different use, 
to everything else. And as a holy God, God could not be more different to us. He's set apart from us in, in every single way. He is the creator, and we're creatures. He's the sustainer, and we depend on him for everything. He's infinite, he's eternal, and we're finite, we're mortal. He's perfect and unchanging, and, and we know, don't we, how flawed we are in ourselves. And Peter says, verse 15, that just as God who called you is holy, so you too are to be holy. Not in who you are, like God, in your being, but in what you do, in your character, in your life. You are to be like the God you belong to. And as Peter calls us to be holy like this, he challenges us in two ways. First, he challenges us about the standard of the holiness we have. In verse 15, he says, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Be holy because I am holy. That's what God says. Now, I'm sure if you've decorated at home, at some point you've visited the paint aisle at B&Q or somewhere like that. And as you go down the aisle looking for white paint, you can believe how many choices of white paint there are. Um, there's almond white, you've got jasmine white, you've got antique white, warm white, chalky white, every white you could think of. And on their own, each one of those colours of paint looks like white. But not when you compare it to pure, brilliant white. You see, there's only one pure, brilliant white. And when it's compared to all the others, they look, they look tinged with yellow, with grey, with blue. And in the same way, the holiness that God calls us to is not jasmine white holiness. It's not warm white holiness. It's pure, brilliant white holiness. As God is pure and brilliantly white, so we too are to be. He's to be our standard. And it's so easy, isn't it, for us to let other things set the standards for us. And perhaps for you, it's the people that you work with. Um, your aim is just to be better than them in holiness. Uh, maybe it's others at church that we compare ourselves to. Uh, aim to be average or above in holiness at Aspley Evangelical Church. Or perhaps for you, if you're honest, you just set the bar yourself. You do what feels right, what seems good enough for you. What is it that you use to set the standard for your life and for the holiness that God calls you to? Well, Peter says there's one standard. There's only one, and it's God himself. He called us not just to better than someone else holiness or equal to someone else holiness or what feels good for me holiness. He calls us to pure, brilliant, white holiness, to be holy as he is holy. Second, Peter challenges us about the breadth of our holiness. In verse 15, he says, we're to be holy in all that you do. You see, as God calls us to be holy like him, he calls us to an, an all-encompassing holiness. It's, it's a holiness that, that pushes into every corner of our lives, that, that changes the way we act in everything. There's, there's not to be a part of our lives that is off limits to God. Uh, there's not to be a situation or a place where his call doesn't apply to us. God wants us to be like him in everything we do. And it's the same, isn't it? Just as it's easy to lower the standard, it's, it's easy to limit how holiness impacts on our lives. Um, to put limits on bits of our life that, that God just isn't given access to. Uh, to draw boundaries between places where we'll be holy uh, and places and times when we won't. Um, to make exceptions. Um, to say that it's too hard, just too inconvenient. That I can't do that now. But God says, as his people, we're to open up every part of our lives to him. To be like him in everything. This is holiness without limit, without boundary, without exception. And as Peter calls us to holiness of such a high standard and such a high scope, he also explains to us why that's the case. And the verses around this, he explains what God has done to make this kind of holiness possible. Uh, the key verses are verse 18 and 19. I'll just read them again. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. You see, here Peter's looking back into the Old Testament, to the Exodus, when God redeemed his people by the blood of a lamb. That's the language he's using. Uh, there, were the, 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 there were the terrible plagues in Egypt, weren't there? Nine plagues. But Pharaoh said, no, I'm not letting God's people go. And so then God promised one more terrible plague. At midnight, he passed through the land and he struck down every firstborn son. And to protect themselves, God told them to take a lamb, to kill it, and to paint the blood on the frame of their doors. So that as he passed through, seeing the blood, he would pass over them. And that night, as the judgment fell in Egypt, it was God's people who were rescued by the blood of the lamb. And Pharaoh sent them out of Egypt. They were redeemed from their slavery that very night. And as God redeemed his people, he did that with purpose. He didn't just redeem them from their old life to get them out of Egypt. No, he he redeemed them from that so he could redeem them for a new life, that they might serve him as his people in a new land. And in verse 16, Peter quotes the words that God spoke to them after he led them out out of Egypt. He called them to be holy as his redeemed people, because of what he'd done for them. That's why they were to be holy, to be like him. That's what he'd redeemed them for. And Peter wants these Christians to see that this is their story too. That in the past, they lived as slaves. Verse 14, they were ignorant. They were enslaved to their evil desires. That was the only way they knew to live. Verse 18, they followed the empty way of life that their ancestors had given to them. But he wants them to see that God has freed them from that way of living. With Christ's precious blood, he's he's taken them out of that life to live a new one. And he's redeemed them for the new life, that having been brought out of ignorance, now they might know God as their father, that as children they might obey, obey him with reverent fear. That having been taken out of slavery, now they might live new lives given to God instead in holiness. Now, I don't know if you know the story of Les Miserables. I can't really say it. My French isn't very good. But it tells the dramatic story of the transformation of Jean Valjean. Um, and, And Jean Valjean's a convict. He's been released from prison. And the only place he can find to stay is with a priest. And the priest is really kind. He gives him a meal. Um, But in the night, Jean Valjean gets up and and he decides to rob the priest. That's the way he can see that he can survive. And so he he robs him and he gets away with the priest's silver. But in the morning, um, he still looks like a convict. He's arrested and he's brought back to the priest. And he claims that the silver he's got was a gift from him. And as he stood in front of the priest, the priest rightly could have condemned him for stealing. But instead, this is what he says. He says, yes, I gave this all to him. But my friend, you, f- you forgot the candlesticks. They're worth more than all the rest. Why did you leave them behind? Now later in the story, Valjean asked the priest why he did that. Uh, and these are his words. He says, Jean Valjean, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver, I've ransomed you. I've ransomed you from fear and hatred. And now I give you to God. And from that point on, in the story, Valjean lived a transformed life. Now, that's, that's just a story that someone's made up. But in the same way, so much greater, we've been ransomed by God for a new life. Not with perishable things like silver and gold or candlesticks, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's what was poured out to make us belong to God. And with this blood, God's not just covered our past, which he has, and delivered us from sin and our failure, which he has. He's also set us apart for a new life. 
that as his people, we might be holy like him. And if this is who we are now, if this is what God's done for us in Christ, then holiness is the only possibility for our lives. It's not an optional add-on. It's, it's the only way that's consistent with what God's done for us. And Peter knows that as we live in an unholy world, that's not going to be easy. He knows that we're going to fail. Um, holiness is going to make us strangers that don't fit in. And the world around us will try to make us forget who we are, forget where we've come from, and forget where we're going, and, and then not live holy lives. And maybe we feel that pressure at, at work. Maybe we feel that pressure at school. Maybe it's just in secret, behind closed doors, that, that, that we know the pressure not to be what God has saved us to be. But because we've been redeemed by Christ's blood, holy is who we are. Holy is what we will be, and so holy is what we're to be right now. And so when you know that you should be different, but you just feel too scared to stand out, remember who you are, that you're God's redeemed child, and you only need to fear him. When at work, you're told that everyone else is doing it, and why do you have to stick out as different? Remember where you've come from, that God's redeemed you to live for something so much more. And and when the choices that your life makes make no sense to people around you, when it looks like you're losing out in life by following Jesus, remember where you're going. That holiness is the path to the best future that God has promised to us. And so as we set our hope on the grace to be brought us, God calls us to live consistently with that to be holy in all we do. But secondly, um, as we set our hope on our, set set our minds on our hope, we're also to love one another deeply from the heart. And here in the final verses, Peter shows us what that love should be like. He shows us why we should love and he shows us how we can love like that. And he wants us to look at how, how our love is doing, how are we getting on as love as a church family. And first, um, he shows us what our love should be like. Um, And in those verses, he describes love in two ways. In verse 22, he gives the positives, what this love should be like. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he shows what this love is not to be like, the negatives. So verse, verse 22, what this love is. Let's read that again. Now you've purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. So Peter says that God has given these Christians love for one another already. They have genuine love. And so as they relate to each other, their love's not to be faked. It's not to be put on because they have to. It's to be real, authentic. It's to have sincerity to it. And this sincere love is also to have depth. Verse 22, this is love that's to come deeply from the heart. It's not to be shallow or superficial. It's not to to kind of come and go with the times. This is to be deep and earnest. Um, Hearts that are are consistent for one another in love. Uh, And in the same way as, as a church family, our love must be sincere. It's got to be more than just an act that we put on when we come through the doors on a Sunday morning. It's got to be more than just hollow promises or empty words that we give to other people when we see them struggle. It's got to go further than just pretending to be interested or just giving an impression that we care about other people. No, No, God calls us to genuine care, sincere love for one another. It's got to be sincere, but it's also got to be deep. Um, Peter says, this is, this is love with a depth. It's got to mean more than just being part of church or, or attending on a Sunday and then stopping at that. It, it's got to push deeper than superficial relationships. And when faced with sin, this is a love that's, that's got to hold on and keep on, not to get disappointed or to turn back, but to grow stronger, even when people fail. This is what love is to be. 
But Peter also shows us what this love is not to be. In 2 verse 2, sorry, 2 verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy and envy, and slander of every kind. You see, these believers have got to get rid of what is spoiling their love. And the malice, the defeat, deceits, the hypocrisy, the envy, the slander, it's, it's all got to go. They're to put that off. That's not who they are now. And instead, they've got to replace those things with what will strengthen their community. Kindness and truth that will build them up. Integrity, humility that's going to bind them together and join them tightly. They've got to use their mouths and their lives with care to protect their love and to strengthen it. And in the same way, God calls us to action this morning to get rid of everything that might be ruining our relationships, to root out those weeds that spoil the relationships that we've been given by him, and to use our, our lives and our lips to build each other up, to bless, not to drag down and to tear each other apart. Now, what might that mean for you this morning? Perhaps that means taking the first step towards someone um, that you've been avoiding for months. Maybe it means apologizing to someone who you know you've wronged, but you've just never wanted to face that. Or maybe it means forgiving someone, letting go of a grudge that you've carried for years. You see, God calls us to be active at protecting our love so that it's deep and it's sincere. But as Peter goes on, he shows us why this love should exist. Um, and, and last week, we saw, last week in the passage, um, we see how through faith in Jesus Christ, these believers have been born again. And here Peter explains how that birth came, up, came about. Um, in verse 22, it's through obeying the truth that as they believed the gospel that they were born again. Um, verse 23, they were born not of perishable seed, but imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. You see, he's saying that God's word is the reason for their new life. It's the reason for their new hope, and it's the reason for their new, new love for one another. And Peter makes his point by quoting in Isaiah chapter 40. He says, all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the fields. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. You see, it compares God's word with human beings. And he shows how people, even the greatest, even the most glorious people, are just like flowers and grass. Now, as you think about the great people of our time, maybe think of rulers or leaders, celebrities, and maybe some of the people who just got honoured in the New Year's honours list. Now, all those people, for all their glory, will one day wither and fall. They're perishable. In a hundred years' time, their glory, their power, their significance, it's going to have long faded. But in contrast to them, God's word stands firm, imperishable, enduring forever. And Peter says that it's this word that's given birth to them, that although they were once perishable people who would have failed and, and faded away like everyone else, now they are imperishable because they've been born again by the one thing that will never perish, God's word. And it might seem strange, but he says that's the reason they're to love each other because it's God's word that's reborn them as imperishable people because it's done that, it's brought them into a family that is never going to perish, a family that they're to love not just now but forever. And in the same way as a church family, although we might change, although people might come and go, we are an imperishable family, locally and with everyone else who is part of the church. We're a family who's been born again to love each other forever. Now, just take that in for a minute. As you look across church at the people here that God's brought together, these are imperishable people if they belong to Christ. 
As you look around, the people in, in your small group, Peter says, these are your imperishable family, people that you'll spend eternity with. And although at times it might feel like we don't have very much in common, although we might not look like very much a lot of the time, and we might not even find it easy to get along, Peter says, our new birth has bound us together in this life and forever. And so love isn't an option because God has put us together. And if God has joined us together, then we're to join together now. Here in Beeston, here in Aspley. And perhaps for you that means coming in from the fringes, getting to know the church family here. Uh, Maybe it means opening yourself up to others and letting them know you so that they can really serve you. But for all of us, it means giving ourselves to others because, because we're in a family that lasts forever. We're to love each other. So we've seen what love is like. We've seen why, we're to, why this love should exist. And finally, Peter shows us how we're to grow in love like this. Um, look at the end of the passage, verse 2. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You see, to love this way, Peter says, like newborn babies, we need to crave pure spiritual milk. Um, Just as it was God's word that created love, so God's word is what will grow love. And so we've got to feed on it like newborn babies. I don't know if you've had any births in the church family recently, um, but the image of a newborn is is perfect, isn't it? uh, I think it's more powerful, more vivid after you've had children. Um, If you've seen a hungry baby, you know that nothing will satisfy them until they get the milk. Now, my son Daniel, I remember the early days, late nights, trying to keep him asleep while Anne tried to get some sleep herself. And because I knew that if he woke up, it was, it was over. There's no chance of getting him back to sleep. You could rock them, distract them, play music, try to put a finger in the mouth, try water. That doesn't work. But nothing, nothing but milk would satisfy. And he would scream until he got it because his life depended on it. And in the same way, if these Christians are to grow in their love, Peter says they need to crave what will help it to grow, the pure spiritual milk of God's words. They can't be content to go hungry. They've got to do everything in their power to get fed because only the word will give them what they need to grow and to mature in their love. And in the same way, if we're to grow in our love, we need to crave this same milk because only God's word can nourish us for love. We can't look to ourselves because we'll fail to be loving. We can't look to others and hope that they'll help us to love because they won't be lovely. Only God's word can sustain our love. Only God's word can grow it. And if we don't have it, then our relationships are going to be stunted. We're not going to be able to grow. Now, it's so good to be in a church that I know values God's word really highly. Um, But... In a place where it's so readily available, we've got to make sure that we're really feeding on it. That we don't just appreciate it or acknowledge it or spend time around it. We've got to crave it as our source of life. That we're not just good at teaching it or critiquing it or or just knowing it and remembering it. We've, We've got to be desperate to drink it for ourselves. And so no matter how old we are or how long we've been a Christian, or how much of God's word we've we've drunk before. It's just as vital for us today as it ever will be, and it ever has been. And so we must keep on craving it like newborn babies. Because as we live as exiles in the world, it's only this word that will help us to live the life that God's called us to live. There's nothing else that's going to show us what our imperishable hope is. There's nothing else that's going to empower us to live in light of it. It's it's only as God shows us the grace that is ours and will be ours. And and as God burns that onto our hearts through his words, it's only then that we'll be able to be holy. It's only then that we'll be able to love one another. 
And as, as Peter calls us to high things, hard things, it's only God's words that is going to help us when we fail. Because only the words can lead us to Christ again and again and again. Only the word can show us that he is our only hope, that when we fail to be holy, when we fail to love, that his grace covers us in, that his blood was enough. And so by grace, let's ask that through God's word, he might help us to love each other. He might help us to be holy in all we do. And he might help us to fix our eyes on our future and live in light of it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the truth of these verses. And they call us to hard things, high things. Um, That you have saved us to be holy people. Um, You've given us new birth that we might love each other. And Father, we know that in so many ways we, we are not holy like you in ourselves. But we trust in the holiness that you've given to us in Christ. And we pray that we live it out in our lives. We know that in many ways we don't love like you love us, but we pray that through your word you'd remind us and empower us to love in the way you want us to. Please, Father, make us a holy people. Make us a family that love each other, um, that we might keep our eyes fixed on our hope and live as exiles in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.